time. Um, sure. Just a formal welcome to everybody, uh, to you particularly, and to thank all our clients for joining us tonight. Um, I'm quite jazzed to be able to look at these seven teams and maybe as a bit of a retrospective thanks to Greg, we're able to bring in some of the back vintages like this. So being able to see these wines two years off release really adds a, uh, a veneer to, to uh, uh, be able to really look inside the wine, which is terrific. Um, right. I'm just going through all my, going through all the research again. I, I was just thinking, I bet when your old man planted the vines back in 71, you had no idea that Kleine Killer was going to become this, this juggernaut that it is today. It's a, no, it's quite a journey, Robert. Yes, it's been quite an amazing journey. And interestingly, we've got Greg Corr on because he's he's been with us on that journey for a long time. Remember him selling sell, selling bird netting to my dad thirty years ago. So that's amazing. Yeah, that's right. No, from small beginnings. So my dad is. Uh, you may know my dad is a CSIRO scientist. He worked with the Australian Government Research Organisation for Science. He, he's really an Irishman, though he was born in England, he considers, considers himself an Irishman. And we came out here in 1968 uh, by ship, actually, uh, because my dad had been headhunted effectively by the CSIRO to work in science. And so we came out by ship and uh, he had a lifelong love for wine. He uh, had grown up in going to boarding school in England, but in the summer holidays, he'd return to his family farm in County Clare in Ireland, where his parents owned a couple of hotels. And I think mainly to keep him out of mischief, when he was a, a teenager, his parents gave him the job of working behind the bar, pouring drinks for guests. And then he graduated to serving, serving wine at the dining tables. And then from there, he had to learn to uh, actually purchase wine. So as a teenager, before he'd really developed a taste for wine, he was, he was uh, serving wine and actually dealing with traveling salespeople. So he had to read about wine to understand it. And he basically, at the age of 14, 15, just fell in love with the, all the complexities and subtleties of going to great, great wines. And it was the start of a lifelong love affair for him. So he, um, when we came to Australia in 1968, he looked at a, the climate where we'd settled in the Canberra region, in the, in the city of Canberra, and couldn't understand why there wasn't a wine industry here. And so he asked some of his CSIRO friends, and of course they all said, well, it's way too cold. And that's because of, in Australia, wine was, in those days, 60s, 50s, was more a warm climate phenomenon. The Hunter Valley, of course, had been successful, the Barossa Valley, over in the west, the Swan Valley. But it was at about that time, too, that there was a whole new... Uh, a birth, if you like, of cool climate viticulture, if you think about the Yarra Valley, the Mornington Peninsula, even a bit later into the Adelaide Hills, other cooler places in Victoria. So he, I think to his great and eternal credit, in 1971 decided to take the plunge. He bought a, a new 44-acre farm, which is a subdivision of a much bigger wool-growing property, uh, about half an hour north of Canberra by car and proceeded to plant vines. And uh, yes, it was definitely for those early years, it was very much a shoestring oper operation. We didn't know which wines were gonna do well, which wines were gonna shine. So dad planted bits and pieces of everything, a couple of rows of Cabernet, a couple of rows of Riesling, and some Sauvignon Blanc, some Chardonnay, some Shiraz, some Silvana, some Mouvedre, all sorts of things to see, I suppose, which varieties in the end would, would really sing. And uh, yeah, we'd learned a lot by trial and error. We had to learn about managing powdery mildew and downy mildew and botrytis. Even I, I guess a fair bit of um, influence of the, the temperature being so cold and, and wet, it obviously must be very specific demands made on the Shiraz in, in that particular region. Yeah, well, as far as the Shiraz is concerned, it, it, and, and of course, over the years, we did discern that you could make a good wine out of any number of varieties, and we still do that in fact, but that really Shiraz, as far as red varieties go, with a, is the one that was really gonna shine. So, yeah. I was looking at the vineyard breakdown, um, the map that you've got on your website, and I was just quite curious to see the, the one section um, we call the CDP vineyard, or the CDP plot. So I would imagine that's where your revert and your Grenache and, all, all those, all those um, alternative varietals of being there. Exactly, exactly right. Yeah, so we've pushed into the Southern Rhone as well as, of course, our, our efforts with the, the Northern Rhone take on Shiraz. And as it, as it turns out, you know, 
the style of Shiraz that we make here, the sort of flavors and aromas and even textures that we see emerging yeah. in the wines are much closer to what you'd see in the Northern Rhone, certainly much closer to the Northern Rhone than anything you'd see coming out of the Barossa or McLaren Vale. So a very different set of flavors, much more that, well, as we're going to see tonight, lots of that glorious cool climate spice, complex spice character, more red fruit than black. Mm -hmm. uh, and it varies, of course, year by year. But yeah, we seem to have um, been able to recapture some of that gorgeous cool climate spice element. And interestingly, we had a staff lunch last week and we had a beautiful wine. I'm a big fan of um, Cote Roti, as uh, you and, your, and many guests would appreciate about my taste in wine. I love Cote Roti. And arguably my favorite would be Jamais, mm -hmm. Jamais and Gigal. I love Jamais, very traditionally made Cote Roti. And we drank a bottle of his 2012. And then we opened one of our 2012 reds. And, and really they were so close in oh, terms of- Oh, brilliant, that. that's fantastic. Yeah. They are remarkably complex and spicy and medium bodied and wonderfully fragrant. So, yeah. And is it similar to clones uh, of Shiraz uh, that Jamais is using compared to the clones that you're using? Well, we don't know what Jamais uses. He uh, goes into a couple of generations that business. Mm -hmm. So, they would be probably doing selection. Masala, I mentioned, they would be selecting cuttings from their own vineyards, which go back to older vineyards, which go back to older vineyards. Right. So they probably don't talk so much about clones, but what we've done at Clonakilla is that we've made sure that we've um, basically sourced as many clones as we can get our hands on, particularly those with good reputation. So we'd have at least a dozen clones of Shiraz in our vineyard. The more the merrier. Uh, maybe you could, before we dive into the wines, you could give us a general overview on 17 for, for Clonakilla as, as a brand. How, how was it in comparison to your 16 and 18, the neighboring years? Yeah, no, it's very interesting. 16 and 18 were both warm years. 16, really warm. Um, 18, just perfectly structured vintage. Uh, and plenty of heat. The, the 17 was between the two. It was, it was the, I think, probably one of the most important factors with 17 was the most extraordinary winter and spring that we had leading up to the harvest, preceding the harvest. It was the wettest winter and spring that I can remember, uh, it was only one of two seasons where we couldn't even get tractors onto the vineyard because it was so wet. And that had been coming off 16 and 15, which had been warm and dry years. So what it meant was that the soil profile was completely replenished. replenished. There was stacks of moisture. The vines were totally at ease. The stress was taken out of the system. And the vines, as the weather did dry up and through the spring turned glorious and, and beautifully warm, but not hot. So no stress, perfect growing conditions, plenty of moisture. And the vines were just as, as happy as Larry, if you like. And I think you can see that in the wines that they are, there's no pinched elements. There's no, the fruit is not like, um, like in a warmer, dry year, you tend to get blacker characters and thicker skins. Here with this vintage 17, the, the grapes were just perfectly calm and, and beautifully structured and a very natural feel to the wines, I think you could say. It never got really hot. It was just steady throughout. But again, that wonderful soil mo moisture profile are just made for a perfect season, really. Now, Robert, I'm sure what you're saying is fascinating and interesting there, but I can't hear you. Have you muted yourself? <laughs> can you hear me now? I can. You were gesticulating marvelously, but I wasn't quite able to interpret. <laughs> um, what, what I was saying was uh, your comments about 17 being um, the settled, calm uh, time in the vineyard. Um, and that contrasts quite interestingly with the warm climate you raise producers who are always pursuing this notion of dynamic tension in, in the vines. So um, is, is that a, a component that characterizes cool climate vineyard production or am I chasing up the wrong tree with that? I think in a cooler climate, you're always closer to the edge of ripening. I mean, one of the reasons Australia is so successful uh, with Shiraz and any number of other varieties really is because of the consistency that we're able to produced particularly in our moderate to warm climates. Like yes. it's, it would be an extremely rare year in McLaren Vale or Barossa 
uh, where you where you struggle to ripen. You can get wonderful ripe characters, pretty uh, almost you know guaranteed. Mm. In a, in certainly in the Rhone Valley, in the northern Rhone Valley, where Cabroti and Hermitage are, and also in the Canberra district where we are, you are you have to work harder some years to establish full ripeness. And I think what that means is you definitely see the personality of the vintage expressed more in cooler regions than you do in warmer regions. Warm. Okay. And, uh, and that's certainly true in, in the case of Clonakilla, uh, which is one of the things, of course, that I love. I, I love, there's two things that I, I talk about when it comes to the very distinctive characteristics of our wines is that I think there's a lot about the vineyard so the Shiraz Vionne always just comes from the estate vines. It's just from that particular patch of vines on the, the estate in Murrum Bateman. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that estate vineyard has a very distinctive personality, the soil structures, the complexities of the soil, the way the hill on which the vineyard is established bends in one direction and another. We have slopes which are north facing, south facing, east facing and west facing in every permutation and combination of those uh, aspects. Uh, the, there's something very distinctive about that terroir, to use the French word, and, and it has a very particular personality, which people that are used to our wines, as, as a number of our, our friends watching here tonight would be, and I know you are, Robert, you would be able to, to detect the personality, I think, of a clonicula. If you saw a clonicula Shiraz Vionne in a lineup of blind wines, uh, you'd be able to pick it straight away because it's a very distinctive personality. Yep. But there's the personality of the site. I want to capture that and express that. Which is, of course, a, you know, it's one of the, those French ideas, you know, like uh, if you apply that to Burgundy, you know, a Latache should take like, taste like a Latache, which is different to a Romney Saint Vivant, even though they're made exactly the same way mm -hmm. in the same cellar with using the same oak to mature them in. A really fine taster who's got experience of both, and that's given the prices that they go for now, it's probably a rarer person now, will be able to tell the difference between a Latache and a Romney Saint Vivant because they recognise the personality of the site yeah, expressed yeah. in those wines. Yeah. So I really love that idea of personality. And I see a lot of what I'm trying to do is capture the essence of this beautiful site that we live in and work on here at Clonakilla. But then overlaid on top of the personality of the site, of course, is the personality of the vintage itself. And as I said a little earlier, because we're closer to the edge of ripening, we have to work harder. We have to work harder in the vineyard, uh, reduce the crop if necessary, shape the canopy to intersect with all the available sunlight in a cooler year. You'll see the personality of the vintage expressed in tandem or overlaid on top of the personality of the uh, vineyard. So those two things, I think, have a pretty Excellent. creative tension between them. Well, that sounds like a really good time for us to dive into the hilltops. So maybe let's have a look at that and maybe if you can walk us through what we're seeing. Yours is in standard size bottle. Yeah. I saw a magnum behind you there as well. All right, well, Hilltops. So here we go. Cheers, everybody. Thank Cheers. you for joining us tonight. So a little bit of background about the wine. So Hilltops is, um, it's actually the region just next to the, the Canberra district. It's uh, a little bit warmer, whereas our vineyard sits just a, a touch over 600 metres above sea level. The Hilltops vineyards tend to sit more at 500 metres above sea level. So still elevated and still cool climate by St Australian standards, but just a little bit warmer than our sites here in the Canberra district which of course is, is perfect for us because one of the main reasons we introduced the Hilltops back in the year vintage 2000, so 20 years ago now, to our portfolio of wines because, you know, I've been talking up the, the qualities and the value of, 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 of having a cooler climate. Mm. But there's also, uh, to, for every, you know, positive, there's a potential negative. And in our case, the potential negative is, is frost that sometimes the cool climate is just too cool and we, we can get severely uh, affected by frost, frost damage. And that's happened to us in a number of years. 99 was a big one, um, 2007 similarly, 2014 we have also had some damage. So, you know, we decided 20 years ago as it turns out that we needed to have another source of grapes from a, a region 
which was known for quality Shiraz, but just wasn't quite so frost sensitive. Mm -hmm. And the so, logical choice was the Hilltops region because it's only like, you know, a hundred kilometers away. So it's within striking distance. So, so altitude wise, how does it differ from your home, your home vineyards? So we sit just over 600 and, and the Hilltops is between 450 and 500 to 550. Okay. And it's a little bit to the north and a little bit to the west of us. And Which so basically means the fruit comes in about two to three weeks before our Shiraz does. So it's right. perfect. Yeah, yeah they're really. And um, so is it is it right to suggest that you're always going to find a, a whisker more ripeness in the hilltops than you would in the in the rest of your Shirazes? Is it um, showing a slightly higher bome, higher warmth? Yeah, that would be that would be true. In an average year, you might see an, a half a bome to a bome uh, higher. A sugar level, sugar content, but I think it also gets expressed as I think you're going to find in that little comparison that we'll do now uh, in the sort of flavour profile that you get in the wine. Yeah. It because it is two to three weeks earlier. It's that little bit warmer. The nights are a little bit less cool, only marginally, it might only be two or three degrees, but it makes a significant difference. Mm. So I tend to think you see a blacker fruit expression yeah. in this wine. Yeah. If if you smell that wine now, and even from a, a moderate to cool year, like 2017, it's definitely got more of that black fruit, leans towards blackberry, black currant, and I think also just a suggestion of aniseed. So mm. it makes me think of those darker fruit characteristics in that aroma. But still, it's it's still got exoticism about the 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 wine as well though there's this sort of wonderful kind of is it musk um there's definitely a, a, a swathe of flavor in there that also sets it apart from certainly in, in its in its price bracket here in singapore i think we're 42 dollars or something a bottle uh, right. for this. and if i think about looking at quality in that sort of price bracket this takes on and beats pretty much the rest of the school there's no question about it there's a, there's a bit of, there's serious gravitas and quality to this wine. Well, we, I'm glad to, to hear you think so. It's the vineyards up in Young, and we, we source fruit from five or six vineyards there now. Mm. They're all growers with whom we have long-term relationships. You know, we, we are in and out of the vineyards regularly. And the thing about that climate, the soils are quite deep volcanic soils, deep red volcanic soils. And in almost all of the vineyards, they tend towards fairly low yields. So we would often average, say, something like two, two and a half tons an acre. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's a, the low yielding vineyards. The fruit character is intense. It's got gorgeous, as we talked about, all those black fruit elements. And in the winery, you know, we give it heaps of attention. It goes through all of the same fermenters, all the same procedures, if you like. Uh, that the Shiraz Viognier goes through and then it's matured in very high quality French oak for, for 12 months. So there's, there's not really anything in terms of expense spared on the wine. We want it to do really, really over deliver mm. quality, you know, in terms of its price category. And, I, and I'm glad to hear you, you feel it's doing yeah, that. No, I mean, I think Tim, we've been, we've been representing Tonic Killer for as long as our business has been going, which that's right. probably around about 11 or 12 years. And, um, it's remained resolutely for me in this price bracket, an unbeatable call every single time. Um, yeah. and re really the quality shines through immaculately in it. Maybe this is a good time for us to look at the Oreada, which um, is my personal favorite um, in, your, in your stable. I, I've, I've always loved this wine. For me, it, it is, especially in this, in this vintage where you're looking at 13.5% alcohol, um, there's a, there's a soothing sort of sexiness about the wine and some great depth to it, which uh, I think is extraordinarily good. Yeah, well, so a little bit about the Orita story. We love the Orita, and I think as far as, you know, that value for money equation goes again, this is a very good, uh, a very good example, I think, for, for a couple of reasons. So it's... This is the story. It's, it's a wine which also, interestingly, just like the, the Hilltops has its origin in the 1999 frost event that led us to think, well, we needed to do something, so we started making a Hilltop Shiraz in the 2000 vintage. The Arida began 
in 2007. That was, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a frosted vintage as well. Really amazing frost in, in 2007. So many vineyards around Australia were, were devastated by that frost. Very late, 16th of November. Unbelievable. And some vineyards in Canberra escaped. Some of the higher vineyards, where the vineyards were planted higher up the hills, escaped the frost damage, where our vineyard at Clonakilla was 90% wiped out. So I called in a few favours, I think you could fairly say, and I bought fruit from five other Canberra growers, just like we've been doing from Hilltops Growers for years preceding this. Uh, I bought fruit from five Canberra growers and made a Shiraz, which we made pretty much exactly the same as we make the Shiraz Viognier, albeit without the Viognier component. So we used whole bunches, long maceration, and then maturation in very good quality French oak again. And uh, it, was a, it, was, yeah, it was a direct response to a frost event, which was devastating. We'd lost 90% of our crop. We had to do something. We made this wine, the Arita Shiraz. And it proved so popular. And because you know, even by that stage, the Shiraz Viognier had, had achieved a certain level of uh, desirability that the price was, it was at a higher price point. Yeah. Yeah. This wine, because it's made from fruit that we buy in from, from growers, in part, as I'll say, talk about in a sec, and we were able to price at a much more moderate price. Now, the other thing that makes, I think it makes excellent value is that usually about half of this wine actually is declassified Shiraz Viognier. Oh. So it, that's, why, that's why I think it's amazing value. <laughs> yeah. is because we, we, don't just make, we don't just make one big tank of Shiraz Viognier. We, we would, every, as I've sort of kind of referred to, every different section of the vineyard, all of those dozen or more clones that we have, we keep separate. We pick separately, we ferment separately. Some of them are on their own roots, some are on rootstock, some face north, some south, some east, some west. Every different permutation of clone, rootstock, slope, aspect, the position in the overall vineyard, every parcel is fermented separately uh, and, and then matured in barrels separately. And then me and my winemaking team will go through numerous over and over again we will taste and retaste blind all of the parcels of Shiraz Viognier that we've made mm -hmm. all of the parcels that we've made and we will carefully select in any given year what we think the very very best parcels are and the very best parcels of course go into the Shiraz Viognier yeah that is a careful selection of the best that vintage has offered of all of our Shiraz Viognier batches that we make of the ones that are still often extremely good, but just miss out on making the cut, they end up in the Orida Shiraz. So, and which, you know, it's, and it's, you know, it's like it's around half the price. So it's yeah. like, it's quite, quite, quite a drop in terms of the financial return, but it's, it does two things. It protects the sheer quality of the Shiraz Viognier, mm -hmm. but it also then frees up for this wine some really good quality material, which, which really is Shiraz Viognier. So presumably with the, with the wild swings of weather, um, you have some years where your production of Shiraz Viognier is vastly lower than preceding years. You, you notice oh, that? Oh, yes, that's right. And particularly because it has to, you know, has to achieve certain quality standards before yeah. we'll allow it to go under that label. Yeah. Yes, sometimes, sometimes the quality is significantly lower. That must be a hair-raising <coughs> process to go through. I mean, firstly, to taste all of these blind and, you know, choose your favourite children and then, then realise that, you know, they have to go into a different label. And it must be an incredibly difficult process to go through. Well, it's, it's, I think we understand, as, and I'm sure many of our uh, friends watching with us tonight will understand that the most valuable thing that a small family business possesses is, is, is its brand. Like, we have to make sure that the Shiraz Fiona is an extremely good wine. I mean, like, we, we, have, we have that reputation to uphold. And that is our greatest asset, is, is, the, is the esteem that the Shiraz Viognier is held in. And as the chief winemaker and the CEO, I must be careful never to do anything that will in any way damage that reality, that yeah. when people purchase Shiraz Viognier, they can be confident that this is, or other things being equal, one of the great expressions of Shiraz from Australia. So, and if that means, as, as it does, I mean, this is, breaks my heart to say this, if that means, as it does in 2020, that there will be no Shiraz Viognier, 
then that's what it means. Yeah. In 2020, as, as you probably appreciate, we had smoke issues, we had fires all up and yeah, down the east coast yeah. of Australia. Yeah. We, we just did not make, we did not make any wine. I think as a, as a shifty salesman, um, it gives me all kinds of reasons to sell um, the declassified fruit at a cheaper price. So we, yeah. even in a bad year for you, we have a, we have a great time marketing the brand. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. But if we look at, it's a good comparison now, if you, we look at, I think and it's a great thing if you've got the two glasses in front of you to look yeah. go from the, the hilltops to the uh, Arita. I, I really am loving that 2017 hilltops right now, by the way. Yeah. Then, but you see what I referred to as sort of more plum, more blackberry. I, I take your point about there is a musk element to it. There's a floral dimension as well. In all of our wines, we seem to get this beautiful... Uh, floral elements and it's just definitely there in that hilltops but then you move to the Arida and you'll see I think a lot more of that spice cracked lost, black pepper a, I dare say a textural difference between the hillside and the Arida there's a certain gloss that I find in the Arida year after year um, and, and a textural like a bite to it a crunch to it possibly I, I would say I would say there's definitely more tension in the palate mm. you see there is, and it reminds me in, in, in some ways structurally of, of Pinot Noir and some Burgundies, where you have this tension point between sweeter characters and savory characters, mm -hmm. uh, between fruit structure and acid structure, mm -hmm. and you've got this tension line strung between them uh, that you want to feel in the mouth. And, I, and I, for me, that's one of the things that make great wine great is that palate experience of, of acid and fruit and the relationship between them that tautness of that string if you like between them and you can certainly see that in the arena yeah. um, i note that this vintage also i mean 97 points and special value star it's certainly from a, a ratings point of view is a slam dunk we've um so out of every bottle we have at the moment but now that we've got greg online i'm going to actually ask him now greg is there more available for us to bring to Singapore of this Arrieta 17. Uh, He's speaking. Off. I'll, I'll chase that up and let everybody know about that. You might be muted, Greg. Yeah, anyway. I think he's muted. It's the first time in his life. <laughs> Greg? I better unmute. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, no, he's back. I, I, right, you're all good. I can check right away. I can tell you in a little while. Okay, good, right. good. Uh, but, maybe, uh, tell me, maybe we should go on to the Shiraz Bionia now. The bomb digging. Right. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I probably said a, a bit about it already. Like, I, it, the one thing that hits me right off the top is it's not manifesting any overt alcohol at all. You know, there, there's some years when, especially when they're younger, when they you know, when I'm tasting them closer to release there's more of a, um, a feeling of, of alcohol, but certainly in what I'm tasting tonight, it's very um, evolved and very developed. Um, I th and I can understand why some people are coming up with the statement that this is probably one of the greatest Shiraz Viognier's they've ever, they've ever seen on release. There's um, something that's very much all together about the wine. Uh, everything's talking to each other in the same, same tone. I think it does capture um, some of those things we said earlier about personality. Um, it has a quiet, uh, um, oh, this might sound a bit grand, but it has an authority about it, even though it's very much a, a wine of subtlety and elegance. And, you know, it's, as, as we've mentioned in the introduction, it's a long way from one of our gorgeous big black fruited brosses that Australia is known for. This is just a different world altogether. Mm -hmm. But all of those elements, like the floral, the red berry, the spice, and by floral, I, I often think, and, and I'm probably not the greatest descriptor, describer of, of flowers, but for me, it's roses every time. And I, I can definitely about, see that. I was wondering about violets, um, which is, I guess is a possible marker always of Viognier. Um, seems to be well, like you know, it's true that Viognier will give you a, will sometimes lift and accentuate that floral dimension. But what is striking is that Canberra Shiraz is floral. Mm. Even without a, a grape of Viognier anywhere near it, mm. Canberra Shiraz will be, will be in, in a good, good year like 17, 
it, it'll just be full of roses, violets, yeah. a floral, a floral lift. Um, I think the dunk shot is this integration. The wine seems so completely finished and together um, yeah. as, it, as it's tasting right now. I'm really excited with it. Well, it's I just that the thing about personality, I, I just think it's so distinctive. That is a very classic Clonacilla Shiraz Viognier. Uh, the, the personality of the site is very much on display there. And, and again, like with all personalities that we come across in life, I mean, some you're going to be attracted to more and some you're going to be attracted to less. So everyone has to go on their own journey with a wine, which is a personality wine. I mean, you could say the same thing about a, like a Wendery or a, a Rockford Basket Press, you know, that they are very distinctive wines and you have to build your own relationship with that, that wine. And exactly the same is true of Clonacilla. Killer. Yeah. Um, but I think it's, I'm interested to see what you think about this, Robert. Certainly in Australia, the last five, 10 years, there's been quite an upswing of interest in cool climate styles of wines of more elegance and subtlety rather than sheer power. Yeah. Are, are, you, are you finding that in your own work? Without question. I think a, a breakthrough was definitely the Cool Climate Symposium in Australia, of which I believe you, you've been quite actively involved over the years. Um, and to the point now where I, you know, we have some 9,000 clients here in Singapore and I get asked very regularly to recommend cool climate as opposed to warm climate. Um, right. And also I think if one breaks down the hot regions in Australia, there seems to be a definite move from a winemaking point of view to restraint, um, to try to attain the sort of equilibrium and harmony that the cooler climate just seems to achieve naturally. Yeah, that's that's totally totally true, and I think also somewhere in there we have to maybe talk about the fact that for many of us, for much of the time, wine at this level is also has its real home on the dinner table. Like you know, it's it's around food, and uh, I think probably we've realised that you want a wine that's got crispness, that's got freshness, that does have a certain lightness of being, if you're going to be matching it with with food. Yeah. Um, yeah. And these, these, there are pendulum swings, and, and wine, as you, as you know better than anyone, Robert, you know, it's, it's in some ways it's as much a fashion industry as it is a, a beverage industry, and, and things come in and out of favour. And mm -hmm. certainly 20 years ago, those hyper ripe Barossa South Australian Shiraz is supported, of course, by, you know, a great man, obviously, Robert Parker Jr., who, whose personal preference with those very rich styles. Yeah. Uh, that swayed the market in a certain direction. The pendulum swung a certain way. Yeah. And because of the marks those wines were getting at 15% alcohol, they thought, well, what, what happens if we get 16 or 17? And the, yeah. it really got a bit ridiculous there like 15, 20 years ago. But now the pendulum has swung back the other way, so, mercifully. Yeah. And we are finding wines with freshness, lightness, subtlety, perfume, elegance, uh, people just can't can't get enough of them. So what, is, what, right. what's the alcohol level of the 17? I didn't actually pull that information out. Uh, it would be 13 and a half, I'm pretty sure. 13 and a half is what it says on the label. It's yeah. a money shot. It really, really is. Because so much else that's coming out of Australia is comfortably in way over 14 and a half percent still. Um, and it, I guess it's a factor of the climate. And it, that's not going to... Um, um, I'm getting I'm getting uh, a note from Greg to say yes there is more Ariada 17. <laughs> so right. I'll email everybody when we when we land that stock. Um, mm. So it, yeah, it's the, I think it seems to be this divergence um, where certain areas in Australia they simply can't uh, create this nuanced elevate this I guess a sense of nimble nimbleness in the characteristics of the Um, mm. um and it's certainly I, I, over the years. There's few wines that I, that I can think back or I've tasted for the first time that changed the way I calibrate or think about wines. Right. Uh, yours was one of them. Um, there was a, a wine out of Heathcote that really made me, took my head off. I remember I was a waiter and they said, I'll taste this. It was about 11 o'clock at night and it was 16.5% alcohol. And I'll remember it, but not nearly as fondly as I remember yours <laughs> because it's not manifesting this huge, humongous sort of smack across the chops. Yeah. Um, and um, you're definitely getting that, 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 that sense of um, elegance. I, hate, I always get told it's a bad word to use, but it really does define 
this particularly tonight at this stage. How do you see this now evolving in terms of uh, timelines? To, some of these wine critics come up with these ridiculously optimistic ideas that add 20 and 30 years onto, onto a, a maturation mm. curve, but I was wondering how you felt with these three wines in particular, how you see them evolving now. Yeah, well, uh, what we've learned over the years is that just because these wines are medium rather than full bodied, it certainly does not mean at all that they don't age with great distinction. What it does mean, I think, is because there's not searing uh, tannin buildup in the wines, the tannins are all fine, they're all natural tannins. We would never have never added tannin to a wine. Uh, so that subtle play in the mouth of the tannin acid balance, I think, is crucial. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the key word it's balance that enables a wine to age. Um, they they can live a long time. You know, obviously in in Singapore, in Australia, warmer places, you'd need to have a decent cellar. But these wines age with great distinction. What we, I mean, a similar vintage to seventeen would be the two thousand and two, and we had a bottle of the two thousand and two Shiraz Viognier just a few weeks ago, which was just delicious, just delicious. That's still with that, still with that lightness and freshness and gorgeous spice and floral, red fruited um, element to it, but they tend to, I suppose, the way I sometimes describe it, they move from bright summer to a, a much more mellow autumn in their in their flavour and aroma mm -hmm. profile. So you see more kind of um, undergrowth, more compost, more earth, more um, leathery elements. I sometimes often see in wines even at five to ten, and then more years of age like a, almost an, a, a roasting meat oven smell, which I find so yeah. delicious. Yeah. So yeah. delicious with some time. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, um, one question that I wanted to ask you was, obviously the Shiraz Vionier is getting these insane ratings. Does it give you any level of anxiety when you see that the, the, the 2019 is now a 99 pointer from Suckling? Um, and uh, do, you, do you feel like a sense of, a sense of urgency about that? Certainly as a salesman, I get really nervous as we get closer to a hundred point rating wine because where, where does one go from there? Do you, <laughs> do you pay any regard to that? <laughs> well, um, I guess you can't help but notice that the marks that are dished out and, and there's, it's interesting with numbers, you know, like, um, I suppose, and, and this is your, this is your business. So you'll have to tell us how it works for you, but the, People do want to see numbers, but numbers are a fairly poor tool for describing the experience of wine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all that they can tell you is somebody somewhere thought that was really, really, really good. But in terms of communicating the essence of the wine, if, you were trying, if that's what you're trying to catch, yeah. then they don't really do a great job. And in a way, it's a bit like, I, mean, I, was, I have to say that people like Robert Parker, he, he, he was a great describer of wine. I mean, he was used very effusive language, but managed to capture some of the excitement about a wine in his descriptions and others have certainly followed in his uh, tracks there. Uh, but I admire that. I mean, someone like Andrew Jeffett, for example, who I'm pretty sure, does he actually put marks on wine? I'm not sure if he does. He has such a beautiful gift of prose. Yeah. He's able to sort of encapsulate the essence of the wine in the words that he uses. So, the, the late yeah. Raymond Chan used to do that so magnificently well in New Zealand uh, yeah. to the point where um, I paid no regard to how he put uh, ratings on the wines, but I was all over his descriptors. I mean, that's his right. interpretation oh, that's of the wine itself was extraordinarily good. Yes, that's a great skill. That's a great and really skill. really studied, yeah. Um, yeah. but, yeah, there's no, there's no, you can't beat, honestly, and, and I think we all would appreciate this as wine lovers tonight. And you've just yeah, got to get your yeah. nose in the glass, you know. Yeah. That's why I, I always prefer these big burgundy glasses for, for Shiraz Vion. Yeah. Well, there's think, so think, much about the aroma. I think we might have a little bit of a back vintage of 16, 17, 18 um, from Greg, and it might be fun to invite you back to do a, um, um, a vertical with us of the Shiraz Vion. Yes. Um, and just see how they look as bodies of work um, over a three-year period. It might well, we, that would be good because we do want to test that theory that I put forward there about being close to the edge of ripeness means that you see much more the personality of the vintage year by yeah, year. Yeah, that yeah. 16, I'm telling you, that 16, I was in the Lake Tahoe. This wine Australia took a group of winemakers over 
uh, to talk to the American wine restaurant trade. And um, the big finale on the last of four amazing days of drinking great Australian wine was the Shiraz tasting. And on the panel was me and Stephen Henschke and Dean Hewitson, and it was been coordinated by Mike Benny, the very lively and wonderful Australian wine writer. And uh, we had all the greats, all the greats on the bench. There was nine taste, nine wines tasted, Wendery, Grange, Hill of Grace, Bests, um, and of course, Clonakilla, mm. a Hunter, a Tyrrells, a beautiful Tyrrells wine, Old Block, I think it was. And what I loved about the tasting was the extraordinary diversity, all of them great wines and so different. You'd never think, you know, really objectively that they were all made from the same grape variety because they very much expressed the terroir, the landscape that they were grown in. And I love that about Australian Shiraz. Mm. But, and we had the 16 Shiraz we in that tasting. And I tell you what, Impressive. put up against Grange or Hill of Grace, whatever you like, put it up against Chave or Egal, <laughs> uh, Lamolin, it will not be embarrassed. And I, yeah. I, forgive, I ask your forgiveness for the vanity of that statement. Oh, that's, that's, that's I've done that, seen it so many times in international contexts where it just has its own song to sing and it sings it proudly. And I, and I, and I really do. The 16 looks so good that day. As the 17, I think, looks beautiful tonight. Well, that's wonderful. Any more mm. any questions from anybody um, of Tim before we say goodnight? Yes, uh, I have one. Great. Uh, hello, Tim. Uh, Jacob. Hey. Uh, this has been very interesting and, and, and uh, lovely to taste uh, all these 2017. Uh, you, you mentioned earlier that you take the Shiraz and you ferment them uh, separately according to what parcel they're coming from. Yep. And you basically keep them separated and, and, and do blind tasting and, and then find out which one will go into the Shiraz Viognier. Right. Um, but when I look at the label it, it, uh, on the Shiraz Viognier, it says it's, it's 6% uh, co-fermented Viognier. How, how do you do that? When, when, I mean, on the label it says co-fermented, but yep. but you say you also keep them separated, and you. Uh, I, I thought when you said that, I thought that you would be blending after the fermentation. Okay, that's an excellent question, Jacob, and thank you for asking it. No, the Viognier is always co-fermented, so the process goes something like this: as the vintage is approaching, uh, where you'll find me is walking up and down a vine rows, tasting, tasting, and sampling and sampling every different individual block of Shiraz to determine when that block is in the perfect position to be picked, when it, the ripeness is just right, when the flavours are just right, the tannins are just right, into my decision when to pick it. So we'll pick that block of Shiraz and then we'll have to find some Viognier because we, we would have 20 or more different blocks of Shiraz and we've probably got about six uh, seven blocks of Viognier, different clones again, different parts of the vineyard. So I'll, it's driven by the Shiraz. I'll find a block that's ready to go, ready to pick, and we'll pick it. And on the same day, I'll find some Viognier, which is more or less in the same place in terms of its ripeness. And it's always co-fermented. So the, the Shiraz we'll put in, we always use, um, almost always, use some whole bunches, maybe between 20 and 30% of the grapes go in to the fermenters without being to stem. They just get loaded very gently into the, into the fermenter. Then we'll, then I'll put Viognier five, six, 7%, whatever, whatever I've decided on top of the whole bunches. And then we'll just stem the rest of the Shiraz on top of that. So to answer your question, the Viognier component is always fermented in the Shiraz. It's never added later as a separate wine. It's always fermented in together. And I, I we do that Jacob, because we feel we get much better integration of the aroma flavor and texture and, and uh, um, in, into, in with the Shiraz if we ferment it together. I think it knits it together much better that way. And it's also that's traditional. That's how it's done in the Rhone Valley. And you know that's kind of our model, if you like. And we've always used that process of fermenting the Viognier and the Shiraz together. So we end up with a whole lot of different parcels of already joined together Shiraz Viognier to select our top crew from. Okay. Um, I have a question from Isaac. Um, 
Are there any plans to send some of the recent single vineyard bottlings over to Singapore? Oh, well, oh. See, Isaac, you're not even supposed to know about that. <laughs> you're, even, you're definitely not supposed to mention them in Greg Crow's <laughs> presence. Now we've got you on point. <laughs> You you won't be happy with the answer. So no just idea. just to clarify, the um, the single parcels. Well, I've talked about them numerous times. So, you know, we make all these parcels are kept separately. Yeah, kept separate. And what we've just done once or twice in the last couple of years, well, in sixteen, a little bit in seventeen, and and, and again in eighteen uh, and nineteen, is just keep a small fraction of some of those parcels. It's not that they're better. It's just that they're very distinctive. Expressive. Yeah. Expressive. Thank yeah. you. That's the right word. And we wanted to just bottle a, a tiny parcel of it separately. And, and it, just, it just goes to some of our um, mailing list members, but it's, they get snapped up pretty quick. And, and very <laughs> sadly, they don't get to Singapore. So sadly, I think, I think the answer is no, as much as we've tried. <laughs> Um, of course, another Don't worry, Greg Cora asks me every year. Oh, does he? <laughs> you think he's going to wear me down? <laughs> so, Tim, another question was the O2 that you mentioned earlier. Is that all uh, in cork, or is there some stolen? Uh, the O2 was all cork. The first year we used any stolen at all was um, O3, mm -hmm. and uh, and then a little bit more in O4 and O5 and O6, and then for my seven, everything was under stolen. So right. The, okay. the O2 was definitely under cork. And, and consequently, as an 18-year-old wine, you'll see a lot more variation. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. At this stage, do you have cork at all in your bottles? Or is everything uh, still? No. The last thing that we had at cork was the magnums were under cork, but they even they saver glasses bought out a beautiful uh, uh, Stolman um, right. screw top magnum, which we, which we use. Yeah. Uh, um, so one more question that somebody sent me. Any new developments with Kleiner Keller that we don't know of? Well... We've answered that one of the single vineyards that we can't, <laughs> we can't get from you. So um, I guess that's answering that question uh, quite well. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Well, the other, I mean, there's other things that, that we do, but that we don't export. So we mentioned earlier that um, that Southern Rome, we do a one which has got this weird Irish name, Kiltoiri, which is the Irish oh, word for mu musician. How do you spell that? <laughs> oh, you know, I can't even remember. C-E-O-L-T-O-I-R-I. -I. It's Irish. <laughs> Kiltoiri. It's ridiculous. It's marketing 101 is you shouldn't use words that no one can pronounce. When we do it with Viognier, we do it with Clonakillo, we do it with Kiltori, anyway. But um, that's a gorgeous wine too. But again, fairly small production. Um, a few other bits and pieces that we do. Yeah. Well, on that note, if there's no more questions, I'm going to... Uh, I just have a quick question. Oh, great. Yeah. Hi, Grant. Yeah. Hi, Ron. I think it's the first time we've actually met. I'm not quite yeah, sure. I, I, I buy a lot of your wine, but I think it's yeah. the first time we've met. Uh, uh, Tim, um, quick, 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 I know this might have been said earlier on, I, I, I mean, I might have missed it, but obviously the big um, Irish flavour. Yeah, I'm, I'm a dually, so I want some. Good man. Well, um, but, but the Plumber Killer, can you give us a, a sense of where that came from? And, and I would actually ah. want to understand a bit more about your background. Um, and, and just to even put this out there, um, we do have one thing in common. Um, I used to own a block of land at Murrum Bateman, um, up on the top of Hercules on Merriman Place. The worst decision I ever made is when I sold it in 1996. But uh, <laughs> anyway. Oh, Grant, that's true. Uh, yes, yes. Look, Clonakilla, very Irish. So it's actually the name of my father's grand was his grandfather's farm in County Clare. Now, and there's a bit of a, there's a good story, which is a sad story, really. My, my dad's parents, um, I don't know why they did this. I don't know why English and Irish people who were aspirational did this, but he was sent to boarding school when he was four. Yeah. And more than that, the year was 1939. And yeah. so it was a scary, a scary year. The war had started and he was sent to boarding school in the north of England, the cold north of England when he was four. And he, that was very tough. And in fact, my dad, I don't know if I should be saying this really, but he, he said to me once that he doesn't, he's not sure he actually ever really fully recovered from that. But um, the light at the end of the tunnel for dad as a child was that he was allowed to go back to Ireland in the summer holidays. And 
he would go back to his grandfather's farm, which was called Clonakilla. And there was, you know, it was Ireland. Ireland wasn't at war. It was neutral in the war. Um, and there was pigs and cows and milk and cream and porridge and potatoes and lots of cousins. And for dad, that was his happy place. So he had this deep heart affection for the family farm, Clonakilla. And so when he came to Australia and, and bought this block of land at Murrum Bateman, he named it Clonakilla in the, in honor of that place. And, um, yeah, so there's, there's that. Uh, my own background, of course, my dad, mum and dad had six boys and I'm the fourth of them. And, um, yeah, I kind of, I actually have no formal qualifications as a winemaker. I never formally studied winemaking. I didn't do the degree. <coughs> I learnt with my dad at his side, making wine. And then, of course, I read a lot and I travelled a lot uh, in Europe and through um, uh, Victoria, especially because we moved to Victoria the year we got married in 1990 and spent time with great winemakers like Bailey Carradus and um, Philip Jones and uh, Nat White and went to visit all those guys, you know, some of the great people of um, Victorian wine. Uh, I just fell in love with it really. And my, my own training is in theology. It's actually in biblical studies and that's still a very great passion of mine, but, but I'd also have this great love for wine and, and also it just emerged that I had a palate. And I think that's in some ways, I actually compare it to playing the guitar, yeah. which I also do. I play the guitar <laughs> moderately well, as it turns out. <laughs> you weren't expecting that tonight, were you? <laughs> uh, I think we need another wine tasting, uh, Robert. I, I think definitely we'll work on that. <laughs> so the thing about playing guitar is that, you know, anyone can learn to play the guitar. You can learn to play chords and um, sing a song, but some people will have a particular flair for it, a particular gift. And I think it's exactly the same with wine tasting, you know, that anyone can Im improve their wine appreciation by tasting more. But some people, and, you know, maybe you would be included among them, Grant, but who just got a flair for it, who just have a way of, feeling flavor and aroma and describing it and and I, and I suppose that's something that I discovered about myself as well over time that I just had a gift for it and and loved it so much and the whole romance of wine making and capturing the essence of the landscape is a uh, well, you know, there's, there's several South African winemakers that actually play music to the vines. And I know it sounds a little crazy, but um, uh, they, in, in the Stellenbosch era, they're, they're big fans of the synergy between grapes and wine and music. There you go. Beautiful. All right, well, we missed any other questions. Anyone else got a question? I have a quick question, uh, Tim. Yeah. So, so um, I, I was actually emailing Robert a couple of days ago to tell him that the Shiraz Marnier is, is actually my favorite wine in the world. And I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about kind of the origin story and sort of how you guys knew you were onto something. Because you mentioned earlier that you were just sort of planting everything. Uh, to find that's that. a great question. How did you yeah, start no, um, iterate the process of where you are now? Thank you. I, I, I love that question. And of course, it is a great story. And, I, and it was remiss of me not to mention earlier that uh, so I mentioned that my wife Laura and I got married in 1990 and um, we went on a, a I suppose you could say a, a delayed honeymoon at the end of uh, in 91 it was in 91 we went over to Europe for a couple of months and my by that stage my interest in wine was growing uh, I didn't know much but I was learning and I'd heard of wines coming from the Northern Rhone and I'd heard that this was the birthplace of Shiraz or Syrah, of course, as they call it there. And I, um, through a, a friend, Chris Shanahan, who was, uh, he worked, was one of the directors of a, a retailer in Canberra and they were the Australian importers of Gigal's wines, of course, the famous Gigal Cotteretis. And through my friendship with Chris Shanahan, I got an introduction to go and visit Gigal, which I did in 1991. And there was completely, um, really blown away 
by the subtlety and complexity and savoriness, the floral perfumes, the complex ethereal notes that you see in the aroma of those wines. I just, I just thought they were amazing, particularly tasting out of barrel, things like the 88 La Moulin, La, La Landon and La Turc. For me, it was a, a transformative moment because, uh, and you, you might well have had a moment or three or four, hopefully, or more, where you smell a wine which just changes your kind of terms of reference. Um, yeah. Reference. Your yeah. wine, the Shiraz. Totally. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, that's such that's a great joy to hear that, Alex. The um, And those Gigar wines did that for me. And, and I thought, well, look, if we could ever make a wine like that, they were a world apart from the otherwise gorgeous Barossa Shiraz that I'd grown up, you know, been exposed to and loved. But these Cote Rotis were something else, particularly those single vineyards. They were magic wines. And I thought, well, if we could ever do anything like that in the Canberra district, that would be awesome. And, um, but here's the miracle. My dad had planted Viognier. He'd planted it five years earlier on the suggestion of one of my brothers, Jeremy, my younger brother, Jeremy, who's now a leading um, senior counsel barrister here in Australia, um, constitutional lawyer, Rhodes Scholar. At the age of 13, he'd said to my dad, dad, we should try something different, a variety that other people aren't doing. And dad thought, well, there was wisdom there. So he, he looked around and read Jancis Robinson's book on grapes and vines and his other viticultural texts and settled on Viognier because there was this parallels between the climate of Canberra and the Northern Rhone Valley. So we, he managed to find through his CSIRO scientific connections, these, these Viognier cuttings and, but they were feeble and it really, it took five years to get them up the wire and across the wire. And they were just about to bear fruit for the first time, exactly the time I was coming back from this trip to the Northern Rhone with my head full of Shiraz Viognier, because my dad's idea had been to make a white Viognier like Condrieu. But I came back from Cote Rotin and said, Dad, what, what about we try fermenting this tiny little bit of Viognier we're going to get in with the Shiraz? And to his credit again, he said, okay, let's give it a go. And that was the, the first vintage was 1992. And the, rest, find is a <laughs> the rest is history. Yeah. So, that was the origin of that. And I, I'm very grateful to Marcel Gigal and, of course, subsequently to Philippe Gigal, who I've visited many times uh, for their inspiration. And, and, yeah, off we go. Well, on that note, I want to thank you for your time, Tim. Wrap up warm. I'm very jealous of your, of your winter. I've been wearing nothing but shorts for 15 years. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's great red wine drinking with us. Yeah, you're yeah. quite right. I'd like to invite Thank you back and maybe we can do that, uh, that retrospective uh, with the wine. It'll be a pleasure. Be It'll be a pleasure. So thanks, thanks everyone. everyone for your time tonight. Very grateful Thank that you'd you. give up uh, an evening to be with, with us. Thank, Thank you. you. See you. Good night, everybody. Bye Good now. Bye. Bye.